My name is Marina Kremenskaya. I'm an associate professor of medicine at um, Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I see patients with various types of myeloproliferative neoplasm, so polycythemia varin related diseases such as essential thrombocytemia myelofibrosis, as well as other myeloid malignancies, so AML and MDS. And that's also my area of, of research interest. Um, so that's where I am, you know, trying to investigate new new therapies and come up with better treatments for our patients. So polycythemia vera is a rare uh, type of blood cancer, and I typically describe it to to patients as a, it's a chronic blood cancer. Um, what makes it different from other types of cancers, especially solid cancers like lung cancer, and breast cancer, is that, you know, the, the reason why most patients get into trouble with polycythemia vera is that they're at higher risk of blood clots. So heart attacks and strokes and other types of blood clots uh, could be in veins or arteries. Um, and this is why, you know, that's the, the major risk of death or other important medical events in patients with polycythemia vera. How it is diagnosed is that um, patients present with really high blood counts. Um, typically, the key diagnostic feature here is that patients will have high hemoglobin, high red blood cells, high hematocrit. Those are the parameters of, of red blood cells. And the reason it's called, it, it is considered a cancer is because the reason why this disease develops is that there is a a change, uh, a mutation, a uh, genetic change that happens in, in stem cells in the blood. And that gives rise to this disorder and all the problems that happen with it. And that's the definition of cancer, basically, is that there is a change that happens in the, in the original cells that le leads to uncontrolled cell division and no cell death when, when cells should be dying. And that's why it's considered a cancer. But it's, if you think about it, it's very different from all the typical cancers that we think about it. It's rare. There's only about 100,000 people with polycythemia vera um, living in the United States. It's not something that we usually uh, hear a lot about or talk a lot about. It's diagnosed. Sometimes people will just have a regular physical exam and, and the doctor will check their labs and they'll see these abnormally high numbers um, and they'll send them to a hematologist for a workup. So that could be one way it's diagnosed. And sometimes people will present with uh, symptoms of PV, which could be um, itching is like a very classic symptom of positive because patients feel itchy. There's not really a good reason for it. There's no rash. Um, and classically, it presents after taking a hot shower or bath uh, is when the itching is at, is at its worst. It's called aquagenic pruritus. So it's itching that happens after exposure to water. Uh, the other symptoms can be a lot of headaches, just feeling tired. Some patients will describe this phenomenon, what they call brain fog, but it's really like difficulties concentrating, difficulties thinking. Um, some people will have enlarged spleen, so they may present with fullness and discomfort on the right upper side of their abdomen. Um, so those are kind of the typical presentations. The number one goal of the treatment is to bring their blood count, specifically the red blood cell count that is represented by hemoglobin, back to normal. Um, and we do that by therapeutic phlebotomies, which means we're basically doing bloodletting <laughs> in the old fashioned way. So um, we physically remove blood. So it's kind of the same procedure as when you donate blood. Um, a needle is inserted and the blood is collected and then it's basically thrown out. Uh, and then, so we're physically removing blood to get the numbers back to normal. Uh, and that has been shown to decrease the risk of blood clots. That's one way of doing it. So patients are typically kind of divided into two categories, low risk and high risk, and that's for blood clots, for thrombosis. And uh, if patients are low risk, then often they can just be managed with the phlebotomies. Um, if patients are considered high risk, and high risk is uh, defined by having um, had a prior blood clot, so a prior thrombotic event, or um, if they're older. So we kind of randomly, not completely randomly, but somewhat randomly, the age line is 60. So if you're over the age of 60 or if you've had a previous blood clot, 
uh, it's considered high risk disease. And then that in that case, additional medications are added to also help to bring the blood cell counts normal uh, back down. Um, some of the examples of these medications are it's a very old oral chemotherapy drug called hydroxyurea. Um, newer drugs are interferons, which are part of the immune system, but have been used to treat various blood cancers for, for many, many years. Um, and the relatively newer drug is something called ruxolitinib or JAKify, which is a JAK inhibitor that specifically um, acts on the signaling pathway that's important in this disease. In addition, most people are also put on low-dose aspirin to decrease the risk of blood clots. In recent years, there has been another um, area of interest in palisitemia vera to develop new class of drugs called hepcidin mimetics or the drugs that affect the hepcidin pathway. Um, hepcidin is a hormone that's produced in the liver and it controls the trafficking of iron in our bodies. So iron is super important in our bodies, needed for everything. But lots, um, very large amounts of iron are needed to make red blood cells. And actually that's where a lot of the iron goes is for red blood cell production. So when in a disease like polycythemia vera, where you're making too many red blood cells, the body uses up all the iron to make the red blood cells. Um, and as a result, patients are often very iron deficient. We cannot, we cannot treat that iron deficiency like we would treat in normal under normal circumstances, because if we give iron supplements, which is really easy to do, but if we give our iron supplements, it's kind of like putting fuel to the fire because it's just gonna make more red blood cells. So a lot of patients are iron deficient because of the, the mechanism of the disease, but also we make them even more iron deficient by removing the blood, by doing the phlebotomies. And many patients can be symptomatic from iron deficiency because of the, the low iron levels in the body. So, you know, some of the symptoms I described, like difficulty concentrated and the itching um, and some of the others could actually also be related to iron deficiency. So anyway, so hepcidin is the hormone that controls iron trafficking. So when the hepcidin levels are high, um, what happens is that there is decreased absorption of iron from the GI tract, but also there is decreased release of iron from iron storing cells like macrophages. So whatever iron is there, it gets stored inside these cells and it's not available to the bone marrow to make red blood cells. And so basically we limit the amount of iron that is available to the red blood cells um, in the bone marrow. And so what happens is that you have less red blood cells being produced. What results is that the hematocrit or hemoglobin, so these markers of red blood cell production goes down, which is what we want in palisitemia vera. So in the way, instead of removing blood periodically as we're doing, we by giving this medication and others that are in this sort of family of medications, uh, we achieve the same result. And the other things that happen, even though we're restricting the iron that is available to the bone marrow to make red blood cells, there is still more iron available in the body overall. And so that potentially improves some of the symptoms that patients may have related to iron deficiency. So that's, that's how, how this drug works. What's interesting about this particular drug is that uh, like I said, it affects the hepcidin pathway, but it's doing it by uh, blocking the negative regulator of hepcidin pathway called Temper 6. So the drug itself, divesterin, is, a, is called small interferon RNA. So it gets into the liver cells, so hepatocytes, and it blocks um, the messenger RNA that it's going to result in a protein that inhibits production of hepcidin. So I know it sounds um, circular, but so basically it's an, it's an inhibitor RNA that blocks the production of a negative regulator of hepcidin, and that results in production, in increased production of hepcidin by the body itself. So what we call endogenous increase in hepcidin. And so what was presented at ASH is phase one uh, results. Uh, from using this drug, divesterin, to treat polycythemia vera. So 
you know, these are early results. Um, not a lot of patients have been treated yet and not over long periods of time, but so far the phase one study had three different cohorts of dosing. So we looked at, first of all, in phase one, when I look at the safety of the drug, so the drug was well tolerated. The most common side effect or adverse events were injection site reactions. This drug is uh, administered by a subcutaneous injection, uh, like an insulin injection. So, and it's only injected once in six weeks. Um, so the most common adverse event was injection site reactions, but it was mild. Patients did not need inter any interventions for these reactions. Um, and then some of the other side effects were things like fatigues and headaches, the kind of things that we see typically with most um, experimental agents. Um, all of these were low grade. None of the patients had to stop the medication because of the adverse events. And there were no serious adverse events noticed. So the drug was well tolerated. And then in terms of efficacy, uh, what it showed is that it significantly decreased the numbers of phlebotomies that the patients needed. So it compared the number of phlebotomies patients had in the six months prior to starting the drug, and then when they started on the drug. And the numbers significantly decreased. Uh, and in fact, those patients that had hematocrit that was well controlled at baseline. So when they, the day that they started the study drug, uh, the hematocrit was, was controlled, those patients remained controlled. They did not need any more phlebotomies of the course of the study that was, you know, the patients got received four injections of the Vesperin every six weeks, and then they were monitored for additional 16 weeks. So those patients that were well controlled at baseline, they did not need any additional phlebotomies. Those patients that had um, high hematocrits at baseline, so they had a lot, a long way to get down to, to be what we considered controlled, um, they uh, needed a total of three phlebotomies for all the patients. So what these early studies showed is that this drug seems to be effective in doing what it's supposed to do, which is uh, control the hematocrit. And looking at the mechanism of action of the drug, which is to increase the hepcidin, we expect it to increase hepcidin. So part of the presentation was showing that as expected, we see increase in the hepcidin. We see it at all of those levels, um, and specifically at the six milligram per kilogram and nine milligram per kilogram, which were the two higher doses. Um, the hepcidin fold increase was about the same. We also showed that ferritin levels, which is a indicator of iron storage in the body, uh, it was very low at baseline, which is what we expect in these patients because they are in deficiency. Uh, with the with the divestorin treatment, ferritin levels went up. Um, that was consistent more with normal levels. Um, and the iron, other iron parameters uh, that we look at is iron and transparent saturation. They were low to begin with, and then uh, there was a small decrease. So overall, the drug did what it was supposed to do. It increased hepcidin and controlled hematocrits, um, and it decreased, significantly decreased the number of phlebotomies that these patients had. Um, so this is exciting uh, for phase one results. And I think the next step is going to be to address this in phase two. And so now that phase one is completed and the results look great, uh, the phase two just started and the first patient was already dosed. And now, uh, of course, additional patients will be enrolled in the phase two study all over the world.